The following podcast is part of a certified educational activity titled Candid Conversations about NSCLC Live from Chicago, Navigating Immunotherapies and Combinations in the Search for the Best Strategy for Each Patient, featuring Dr. Benjamin Levy, Dr. Hossein Borgai, and Professor Tony Mock. Access the entire activity and complete the post-test at peerview.com forward slash WED860. Downloadable slides and practice aids are also available. First of all, for those who don't know me, I'm Benjamin Levy. I'm an associate professor at Johns Hopkins. I first want to thank uh, Peerview for thinking a little bit outside the box on this programming. Uh, this, as you can see, is a late night TV show programming for a CME event. So this will either be one of the best programs you've ever been to or a complete disaster. Um, but I think it will be the former rather than the latter. I think we have a great group of faculty uh, to help uh, deliver the content. Um, I thought I would try to frame what we'll be talking about and the presenters through the lens of my own experience as a lung cancer oncologist and some historical perspective. Um, you know, we. A lot of us choose fields for many different reasons. Oncologists choose fields for many different reasons. Some of my colleagues in fellowship chose a particular field because they had a great mentor. Uh, and so they logged on to the mentor during fellowship and it all worked out and they ended up being a great breast oncologist or colorectal oncologist. Um, some folks choose um, a particular field because of science or scientific intrigue, you know. A fellow may be interested, or a trainee may be interested in HER2 signaling and go into breast cancer, um, or RAS signaling and go into pancreatic cancer. You know, I'll be quite honest and transparent, I chose lung cancer for one simple reason. Uh, it was easy. Um, there really wasn't a lot of interesting data 12 years ago. We basically had four drugs. We had platinum doublet, we had pimetrexid, we had bevacizumab, and we had a TKI or lotinib or gefitinib that you could give to anybody. You didn't even have to have the mutation. Thank you, Tony, for sorting that out for us. You need to have the mutation to give uh, the TKI. Um, and I think since that time, uh, we've had incredible, unprecedented, in at least the five years, unprecedented scientific advances that's predicated on, on really good investigational work. Uh, and because I look more like David Letterman than I do Jimmy Fallon, I'm gonna channel the top 10, but instead do top three. Top three consequences of these advances uh, in lung cancer. And I'll start with number three. Number three, these advances have importantly translated into improved patient outcomes. We've seen a firmer understanding of genomics. We've got EGFR and ALK, which are just the tip of the iceberg. We now have ROS and RET and BRAF and HER2 and INTRAC, all actionable mutations. Coupled with that has been this field of immunotherapy and, and leading, uh, uh, the, being the leading edge of lung cancer. All of these things have translated into better patient outcomes. Number two, these advances have spurned further scientific discovery, that the amount of work going into the translational science, understanding the tumor microenvironment, drug discovery with all these license plate therapies um, that we don't have names for yet, the amount of work that's going in now, I think that we really have uh, really wet in our appetite to do more work and more science, and that's number two. And number three, and while you're here, these advances have led to utter confusion on behalf of the physician who's treating patients these days. The incredible complexity of, of science now and delivery of drugs and how to sequence things, we're all gonna try to tackle that today. But this complexity is evidenced by when you take a look at the NCCN guidelines, it reads like a choose your own adventure novel. Uh, you can move to page six and then refer to you back to page two, then on to page 10. So it's a lot to keep up with, and I hope tonight that we can help uh, uh, sort some of these things out. I can't promise all of them. 
Uh, and so I'm fortunate enough tonight uh, to have two people that I have no business sharing the stage with. Uh, we've got Tony Mock, uh, who many of you know is internationally known, has, has been leading the field in many of the targeted therapy trials as well as immunotherapy. Um, he's been the recipient of many awards, including Best Dressed at ASCO for the past five years. He has the ribbons to prove it. He'll show you later. Uh, and then uh, also Haas Borgai, uh, who also is an international uh, leader in the field of lung cancer. Haas has been in involved in many immunotherapy trials. He's led the way with dual checkpoint blockade and resistance setting combinations. And he's been kind enough, if you flip open your brochure uh, to the page where we're all there, he's been kind enough to provide his high school graduation photo. Uh, so don't be alarmed when you see him tonight. He looks a little bit different than that photo. This is him. Don't worry. This is him. Um, so I'm really excited to have both of these guys here to help distill uh, this complexity. It's my pleasure to bring to the stage Professor Tony Mock. He is a professor of clinical oncology. He's the chairman of the Department of Clinical Oncology at the Chinese University of Hong Kong in Hong Kong, China. Uh, he is a, an incredible speaker, and I assure you his suit is not bought off the rack. Tony, come on up. So great pleasure, Mike, to be here. Being someone from China, this is the closest I can get to a to nice show uh, with David Letterman. So navigation indeed is part of our life. If I want to find Hyatt Hotel, I go to my iPhone. So for the navigation process, there are two components. First is that you really have to have the tool. And then second, you have the software and the thinking process that eventually help you to find a way. So you cannot really go with one or the other. But then speaking of the tool, we have actually changed a lot. I mean, we have gone from so-called the very crude navigation on the shipping business to now everything is just on the phone. How do we use this in the best way? With the two in the lung cancer situation, I think we have two components as well. On the navigating tool, we need the biomarker. And then finding the way will be actually the so-called the clinical trial data that support on our navigation process. This is the list, PDL1, TMB, we are all familiar with. But then there's also future coming on gene signature and to infiltrate or others. But tonight, we may not have time to go into detail of the other two. But then on the treatment, we are facing with either single agent, chemo IO, or chemo IO, bevacizumab, or even IO IO. But then tonight, I'm just going to focus, start with PDL1 expression. And let's see how would this correlated or lead us into the decision process of single agent, IOIO, chemo IO, or chemo IO Beth. Very complex these days. But I think the data is actually very helpful at this moment. First of all, PDL1 is, is a what we call a quantitative biomarker, meaning that it is a spectrum of expression. Once you have that, you need to define a cutoff. In a defining cutoff, what we really do need is the so-called a testing set and a validation set. So this is actually an essential process that we have to go through. So if someone comes to the office and says, say, my biomarker is the best, you really have to ask, what is your testing set? What is your validation set? Otherwise, it would be just kind of like pulling something out of the air. Focusing on the Trinito C3, which is the standard and the FDA approved agent, what is the story behind this? Well, it starts off with a very important study by Edgar Ron in New England Journal of Medicine. So this is a um, so-called the um, Kinox 001. As a matter of fact, the mature survival data will be presented in this meeting later on. So in this original study, there's approximately 500 patients. And then the first set is a testing set, 182 patients. And then there is another over 300 patients as a validation set. So with such, starting with the testing set, they do the receiver operation curve, ROC. And then in the shoulder, that is likely the optimal point where you can use it as a cutoff, which is 50%. So it's not just 
as 50 percent. It's the 50 percent as defined by ROC. And similarly with this, then when the other important aspect of any biomarker is the fact that you have to know how likely, how frequent it's going to, going to occur. So first, from the Keynote 001, the strong positive, which was 50 percent, 23 percent. Weak positive, which is the 1 to 49 percent, 37 percent. And then the negative is about 40%, 39%. Now, this is good from one study, but it's not enough because this may be just one selected population going into a phase one trial. It may be biased. So they have to, another bigger set is from the Keynote 010. They show almost exactly the same percentage. So with almost like 3,000 patients, given this incident, you are confident that what are the likelihood of your patient having strong, positive, of weak positive or negative uh, pdl one expression. With that, they look into the first the response rate. You can see that the highest response rate, whether it's previously treated or treatment naive, they actually have a consistent high response rate in the patient with strongly positive than the other. Translated in the over survival, you can see that in the 001, you can see that that is the one giving you the best over survival, better than 1 to 49 and better than 0%. As previously noted by Professor Mock, updated five-year overall survival data from Keynote 001 were reported at ASCO 2019. These data demonstrated a five-year overall survival rate of 23.2% in treatment-naive patients and 15.5% in previously treated patients. The five-year overall survival rate among patients with pdl one TPS greater than or equal to 50% was 29.6% in treatment-naive patients and 25.0% in previously treated patients. These data represent the longest follow-up data for pembrolizumab in lung cancer and compare favorably with historical pre-immunotherapy overall survival rates of about 5%. And when you look into a second study, the CO10, you also see the same phenomenon of the 50% being the best performance. So using a testing set, validation, and then two major clinical trials to demonstrate 50% is likely the optimal cutoff. Now, how does it compare with the other biomarker? I'm quite sure you are familiar with this study called Brupin, reported by Fred Hirsch. They used the four different, bio, four different monoclonal antibody, and they find that basically three of them actually cover each other quite well. So in other words, in other words it's quite consistent between three. Only one that's falling slightly out of the chart is the Ventana SV142. That is slightly lower in terms of sensitivity. So that's why that in the TC3, IC1, IC3, the biomarker cutoff is not as so-called sharp as what we have UFC in 22C3. So out of all this, what we can really conclude is the fact that yes, PDL1 expression at 50% using 22C3 is a reasonable biomarker, not the perfect one but reasonable biomarker, a tool that we can use in the clinic to select the patient for treatment. Now, based on that, then they have a famous 024 study. I don't need to relate to it anymore because this is a phenomenal study. A patient over 50% got randomized to PAMBO at 200 versus the standard chemotherapy. And long behold, you have the median progression-free of 10 months versus 6 months has a ratio of 0.5 published by Martin Rack in New England Journal of Medicine that established a history, a justification, number one, why we need to do the pdl one status, number two, giving single agent to patients with over 50%. Now, with this kind of data, then you ask another important question is that would that have any implication to over-survival, and this is your over-survival outcome, 30 months versus 14.2 months, almost double in terms of survival. So with the response rate, progression-free, and over-survival, that is pretty well established in a new paradigm of selecting patients using the pdl one at 50%. But of course, we want to say, hey, can we use it on the low one? Remember, there's a question, the patient 45. Is 45 absolutely inferior to 50? I don't think so. You can always knock at the door on pathologist. Did you drink last night? If not, can you look at it again? I'm quite sure they come back as a 51% if you talk to him. So it's not an absolute thing, but the question is, can you really apply it clinically on a less than 1%, less than 50%? So in the 042, we are set out to ask the question, patients who are over 
what is going to happen. This time, we did a bigger population of 1,200 patients. The reason is that we used the primary endpoint as an over-survival. For over-survival endpoint, we do need a much bigger population to cover the spectrum of the difference. And this one summarized it. 50% clearly well-defined it. If you use 20%, you also see a difference. Even in 1%, that you also see a difference. However, the hex ratio is slightly is a bit less, 0.81. But one important issue I have to bring to your attention is that when you look into the subgroup analysis, the export analysis, 1 to 49%, you do not see the over-survival benefit. So in other words, it is a continuum of benefit. Likely that you know, the cut of 50 is a very practical one. Of course, it's not absolute to say that you cannot use single agent when it's less than 50%, but then you can only say that the efficacy is only as equally well as the chemotherapy. So at this moment, April 11, FDA had expanded the fembolizumab uh, cutoff to about 1% to, uh, based on the Kinox 042 data. Now, but to me, in general, I would say 50%, I would favor using single agent, but we make controversial, 1 to 49%. Like, for example, if the patient is not fit enough for chemotherapy, that is a consideration. But the, of course, there are combination studies which I'm going to uh, discuss at this moment. Chemo IO versus chemo. Now, this is the table summary. I'm not going to go through every study, but it's easy for you to see every single outcome is positive. 189, uh, 150, 407 on square mass cell, 131 on square mass cell, 132, 130. All these randomized studies are positive in terms of the improvement in progression three and also over survival. So that's e easy to say that yes, adding to it is better. But when you come to the clinic, there's some practical question. I raised three today for you. First of all, when you have someone who has a 50%, should you use a single agent IO or combination of chemo plus IO? Second, when someone is less than one, zero, can I use chemo IO or can I just use chemo alone? Third is that what is the role of bevacizumab? Let's try to dig out some of this information from the existing randomized study to just to shine some light on these questions. When I put Kino 189, which is the chemo versus PAMBO versus chemo, and then Kino 042 side by side, has a ratio 2.42, for Kino 189 and 0.63 on the other one. Separation is pretty well the same, and you can see the one-year survival is actually quite close, quite similar to each other. But more importantly, it is a fact that when you look into the progression-free survival. Now, you can see that 189, the curve separated very early on. As compared to Kino 024, the two curves can't overlap each other. So in other words, there are, is a portion of patients who actually do not benefit from single agent, and their efficacy is actually not is similar to only chemotherapy. When you look at progression-free survival, they are similar, but then response rate, 61% with chemo IO, as compared to single agent, about 45%. So what does this tell me? So if I really want someone to improve quickly, maybe 189 is the way to go. Maybe someone who is more stable or someone more elderly than single agent probably is the way to go. Now, this is only interpretation, but this is the best data that we can have. It's a slight different in terms of the shape of the progression-free survival curve and also the high response rate of over 61% with the chemo IO-189. All right? So this is the highlight that you need to watch out for in terms of progression-free survival. Second question. When it comes to less than 1% or 0%, no expression, what do I do? Can I give chemo? Especially in Asia, where I come from, it's expensive to, uh, to give chemo, to give IO, and patient to pay out of pocket. What is the best recommendation for the patient? Now, if you look into the over-survival curve of Kilo 189 in the patient who are less than 1%, you can see that over-survival, you do have a benefit. But in progression-free survival, although they report a hazard ratio of 0.75, the curves are really quite close to each other. Now, to me, that is not convincingly saying that the combination necessarily better than chemotherapy alone. New data from the Keynote 189 trial were also reported at ASCO 2019. 
An updated analysis of the overall survival endpoint showed that after a median follow-up of 18.7 months, pembrolizumab in combination with pemetrexed platinum chemotherapy reduced the risk of death by 44% compared with chemotherapy alone. Progression-free survival was also improved with a 52% reduction in the risk of progression or death compared with chemotherapy alone. And that's not the one study. There's also <clears throat> the other study of IMPAL 150, TC0, IC0. You can see that it's 7.1 months versus 6.3 months. And then the hazard ratio is 0 0.77. So very much similar to what Keynote 189 had told you in the subgroup analysis of the zero expression patient. So at this moment, I think it's still a bit controversial, especially, uh, you know, in a way it's that, you know, you can actually give chemotherapy and sequentially have IO as a second-line therapy, as which is supported by a number of randomized studies as well. So I would not routinely myself give every patient chemo, or I, chemo and IO when their PD-1 expression is zero. Last question, value of bevacizumab. Now, I'm power 150 shed the light, but there are actually a number of preclinical data that support the concept. So arm B and arm C, it is four drug, texo, carbo, beth, and atiso versus texo, carbo, beth. As compared, arm A and arm C is atiso, carbo, um, te texo, carbo, atiso versus texo, carbo, beth. Now, this kind of gives you a little bit of subtraction to see whether the combination of beth and IO may have some additional benefit. So if you look into the efficacy arm B versus arm C, then you do see an improvement in both a progression-free survival and over-survival. The curve is separated. But when you look at arm A and arm C, you can see the hazard ratio is 0 0.94. There's no significant benefit. So in other words, there seems to be a signal regarding the BEV. However, the more data actually come from the EGFM mutation positive subgroup, there's only about 10 patients, the 10 percent of the patient. And then I presented this in ESMO Asia last year. And you can see arm B versus arm C separate in the progression-free survival, overlapping each other, uh, you know, in the uh, arm A versus arm C. But I remind you, the number of patients is very small, only 30 to 40 patients per arm, okay, in this subgroup analysis. And then on over-survival, you see the same thing. B versus C, you see a separation. A versus C, you don't see a separation. So when you put it together, I think there is a potential concept of an anti-angiogenic drug combination of IO may improve the benefit. However, this needs to be further investigated. The subgroup analysis is based on small sample size. We cannot take it too seriously for the time being. But there are studies being done. Now, coming to TMB. TMB help us to ask, ask the question, should we use a single agent IO or IO IO? Now this is the concept of tumor mutation burden. Every cancer cell had mutation. When you got mutation, you got antigen, you got new antigen. So we can kind of measure the total mutation uh, low as an indication of how much new antigen there is and believing that more and new antigen, there will be more immune response. It makes sense. However, there's a problem. Mutation to new antigen to immune response. However, what percentage of mutation really give you new antigen? Do we know that? Not all mutations are the same. Not every mutation will give you new antigen. We actually don't have too much of idea what proportion it is, unless we do very deep sequencing and then define what a new antigen is a new antigen. And then the other problem is that not every new antigen can cause a new in vivo response. We're not quite sure about that either. So in a way, the mutation burden is nothing but a surrogate indication on the probability of this process, but not an absolute representation of such. Now, so you know, when you look into you know, this so-called how often it is, it's only approximately 10% as, as, as what we suggested. But on the other hand, the first data is come from Nair Visfield, is to look into the whole genome sequencing, and he was the first one to demonstrate that in a very small population of 38 patients, patients with the higher likelihood of, of the tumor mutation burden, cut off at around 200, are more likely to have a survival benefit. But on the other hand, again, the cutoff was arbitrary, it was an exploratory analysis. So, 
you talk about that, but you still have to measure it. And now that gives you a bit of trouble. The real way of doing it, you have to do a whole exome sequencing at least. But the whole exome sequencing is relatively complex, and then you, it's a little bit more time consuming. And of course, nowadays with the sequencing ability, we can do it well. And then based on that, then we'll try to measure the total number of the so-called the mutation uh, number. And the first data was done on checkmate 026, and then they were able to define the total mutation burden. And then it was actually first to give us a data, which I'll share with you in just a moment. However, we cannot do whole genome exome sequencing on every patient who walks through the door. So foundation come in and say, hey, I can do it because I am doing ta target sequencing. Uh, the target sequencing is different from whole exome sequencing. Easier, but they select their own mutation. But remember, when they select their mutation, the panel of 389 uh, gene, they were not thinking about too many mutation burden. But then the good thing is that they can do greater depth. And then because of the more targeted, they can do the deeper sequencing to identify the presence absence of this mutation. And this is what they've done, is that they basically do look at all the variants, remove the polymorphism, pre remove the, the so-called predictable driver gene, and then what you're left are the mutation burden, okay? And they were managed to have approximately, initially, about 20, 30 cases, and do a concordance. Now they have a more elaborate concordance, and they were able to see that there's a reasonable correlation with the R2 at a 0.88, which is quite good. But there's one thing. Antigen you measure in the tissue may be correlated to the total amount of the in the plasma, but they may not be the same mutation. There's no absolutely comparison of the mutation, whether they are the same mutation or different mutation. It's just the quantity is similar. Okay? Now, this is a bigger set, uh, you know, between the, the panel from the checkmate 0 to say the concordance is actually quite nice. But then the other way is to do it in the plasma. So this is a study that Derek and Dara and I share. We use the proper study set as a training and then as a validation. See, we believe in the training validation process. And then proper is a randomized phase two study, OK is a phase three study, and they're exactly the same design. So therefore, it's the best time to use this two set. Now, this is actually very important in a way is that we were able to demonstrate, <coughs> look, because we also got tissue as well as plasma. We have a very nice concordance curve, as you demonstrate over here. But look at it. The shared variant, the exact the same gene, only occurred in about 59% of the gene. And then 26% only in the blood, 25% only in the tissue. So this is exactly demonstrates the point that I tried to make, is that you may have the same quantity, but they're not the same quality of the gene. So this is a very important point to remember when you look at the tumor mutation burden. So now let's go into clinical situation. Four study that we have right now, 026, uh, 227, checkmate 226, 227, Mystic and B first. As you can see, the data is a little bit, you know, wish you, well, I won't say wishy washy. It's a bit erratical. You, you don't know how to interpret that nicely. There are some positive and some negative. It's not as clean as what you have seen previously with the multiple uh, study that I've showed that all positive. So let's look in a bit detail. Now, CO26, yeah, basically, if you look at the levonimab arm and the chemotherapy arm, the patient who actually have the highest mutation burden, this is the first line situation uh, 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 for the, for the, uh, for the uh, levonimab. You find that the best survival are the patient with the highest mutation burden, okay? And then, you, but then you see the uh, the other way is that the lowest one on the chemotherapy arm will give you the highest survive, uh, survival. But the sample size is actually quite small, 47 patients already. But that's the first time give you some signal that you can use tumor mutation burden as a predictor of over-survival in this group, uh, profession-free survival. So this is the first piece of data. We were kind of uh, intrigued by it, but then we are not actually able to put it into action. The time when we were able to put this a little bit action is checkmate 227. Now, this is a very complex study. Every time I try to explain, I don't know how to explain it. So they divide two groups, PDA1 positive, over 1%, and then less than 1%, and then three arm. I'm not going to go through the arm, but I want just to say that what they have done is that they first have to identify a patient who got sufficient tissue to do TMB. 
Now, so once you have that, it's not a pure randomization because you're actually guided by the tissue that's available. So they extract the patient with the mutation burden, and then they were able to identify the patient with mutation burden. You can measure 139 of them that had gone into the NEFO plus AP, and then the other one, about 160, going to chemotherapy. So true randomization or not, very controversial. I, you know, this, this is this, uh, in my own personal opinion, because you're supposed to have about 2,000 patients, but actually end up only 1,004 patients had the mutation burden measured. But in the high burden, 10 cut off, they were able to see the separation. But then just a minute, where does this 10 come from? I don't really know, but it seemed to be good. <laughs> That's why the, when you see a foundation medicine report say high, it's 10. I don't know why it's a 10. Where does the testing set? Where is the validation that? I don't have that. All right? So that is where the problem is. But it gives you a signal that there's a separation in terms of outcome of 7.2 months versus 5.4 in progression-free survival. However, you know, if you look into high prevention burden and the PD-1 status, it seems to be, hey, doesn't matter whether it's high, high expression, low expression, that's a message they want to give it to you. But that's one thing. When you say high of over 1%, how many of them are actually over 50%? That part I actually don't know either. So whether we can use it, this cutoff of one, which is not a validated cutoff, to say that it does not matter whether it's PDL1 and you can use tumor mutation burden instead, I think this is very controversial. Okay? So I think we really have to ask the question, what proportion of the patient are actually 50% in this group? But then there's also a, part, a bit of disappointment in the outcome is the fact that in over-survival, actually there's not predictive value. So at this whole set, I think we kind of learn a bit about tumor mutation burden, but I find it difficult to translate it directly in the clinic for the time being. Now, another study important is the MYSTIC. MYSTIC is actually randomized to DUVA, DUVA EP, and also the with chemotherapy. It was negative. However, they were able to deep dive into the uh, plasma DNA in the mystic. And with this, they were able to identify the patient with high and low. But this time, they do a so-called continuum and then find that it's actually at over 20 that they were able to be, have an indication of the survival benefit. And then you can see the free curve separate quite nicely. So now, all of a sudden, the cutoff becomes 20. Again, where does this come from? I think we will have some problem, but then B first is another one, use another method. This time, they were able to then indicate that, that using either 16 or 20, but based on the fact the prior study with Popper, they decided to use 16, and they were able to demonstrate slight improvement of the progression to survival. However, I think we are still learning. It's still so much for us to learn on the TMB before we can take it really to the clinic. But for that, there are other studies hopefully coming out in the future for that. Allow me to summarize. I think we, at this moment, need an accurate tool. PDL1 seems to be reasonably uh, so-called validated and then applied it with multiple clinical trials to see the data that suggests that. The controversy still exists, which is the best method to tackle the 50%, but I more prone to use the single agent if I can. Controversial, what whether I should use the chemo or chemo IO in the less than 1%, but I'm prone to use chemo more than chemo IO, given the fact that I have to be paid. And then, so on the tumor mutation burden, we have to understand the mechanism behind it, but so much so that in the clinical application, we still have a lot more to learn. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Tony, come on up. First of all, congratulations on, on uh, completing the slides in the relatively short amount of time. One minute overtime. Yeah, Haas and I had a bet. I actually just lost $20. <laughs> um, you did a good job. Um, let's, we've got a few questions from the, the audience. Um, I want to ask one question first. We'll do two questions, and then Haas will come up afterwards. You, you mentioned for PDL1 zeros that maybe you wouldn't be using triplet therapy with immunotherapy. What is an instance where you, what would be your go-to regimen in an asymptomatic patient? Let's say a symptomatic patient who's driver mutation negative and PD-L1 zero. What, what, what goes into your decision making on using uh, the chemotherapies? Right. So it, for patients who have PD-L1 zero, if you look into a keynote 189, then you actually see the response rate was different, about 30-some percent versus 14 percent. 
although it's different, but then the so-called control arm response rate is lower than expected. So you have to ask the question, is that sufficient for me to say every patient have to receive it? So I think in the American system, it's slightly different because yeah. they've reimbursed it. But in the Asia system, that the patient really have to think twice about the use of I.O. So I usually have a very frank conversation to say that there may be some additional benefit, but it's not huge. And then uh, I may not kind of say, you know, if the patient relatively stable, then I'll probably use chemotherapy first. Okay. But of course, that if the patient is not stable, he only got one shot, and you really don't want to miss the shot, then I would suggest to use a combination. Okay. And your um, comfort level in using bevacizumab with chemo for that patient, is that something that you routinely do? So now, that is come to another controversy, the so-called taxocarbo combination is very American. <laughs> in Asia, especially for adeno, we hardly use taxocarbo. Okay. So can I tr tr directly translate that what I'm power 150 using taxocarbo into a limited carbo bath yes. and a TSO? Yeah. Not quite. Okay. However, there will be one study coming up using the four and hope when that data become available, I will be more comfortable to use a limited carbo uh, bath and um, a TSO. Okay. I'll do uh, one question from the audience here. Um, um, what comorbid conditions other than autoimmune diseases and history of organ transplant may impact your decision to treat a patient with or without a checkpoint inhibitor? Are there any other comorbidities that may sway you not to use a checkpoint inhibitor? Or do you have a, a you know? Right, so I think we only have some soft point that I, 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 will, I will consider. Number one, any interstitial lung disease. Um, and second, did the patient ever have a large field radiation? Although we don't have any solid data, but I've seen some patients who had radiation to the lung, and then with the IO, they got a recall yeah. pneumonitis. Yeah. So if they have that, then I would be a little bit you know, conservative you know, in terms of IO. Yeah. But I think all these are relative, you know, and you really have to see what kind of potential benefit the patient may have yep. versus this risk. Yeah, medicine as an art and not necessarily a science yep. sometimes. Exactly. Thank you, Tony. One last round of applause, applause for Tony. Haas Borgai, uh, professor and chief of thoracic oncology. Uh, he's from Fox Chase. He's led many of the trials uh, in, in immunotherapy and, and has a, a real firm understanding of what we're doing potentially in the resistance setting. Haas, come on up and give us your take on the resistance setting for IO. <laughs> Thanks for coming. Thank Thanks you. for coming. <laughs> all right, enough jokes about how much older I am now, all right? I'll change this picture. I've heard it from Stephen Liu. I've heard it from Ben. Everybody makes comments. Who has time to take new pictures? Stop. All right. Thank you for being here. My talk is a little bit more forward looking, uh, which basically means I have no phase three data to show you. I'm not going to make any conclusions as to what to do with patients who have progression after chemotherapy and immunotherapy. So if you want to take a nap, this is the good time to do it. So we are going to be faced with a patient population who, as you just heard from Tony, has been treated with chemotherapy and immunotherapy in advanced stages of uh, non-small cell lung cancer. And I think the burning question that we all have is, well, what are we going to do with these patients now? I don't think any of us are happy with the old days of going back to docetaxel, gemcitabine. I think we've made a little bit more progress. And we're sort of hoping that we can build on this momentum that targeted therapies, immunotherapy, and all of that have given to us. So we're not going to be talking about targeted therapies because this is a completely different discussion, obviously. But for immunotherapy-treated patients, I'd like to divide them into a couple of different categories, at least the way I think about them. Um, there's this concept of primary resistance, meaning that you have a patient in front of you who's getting immunotherapy, and while they're getting the drug, they're actually having disease progression. So there's something wrong with that interaction. That tumor microenvironment is not responding to immunotherapy. On the other hand, you might have a couple of patients who actually show an initial response to immunotherapy, and then they have progression. Under that category, I still divide my patients into two subcategories. There are patients who are on treatment for six months, seven months, eight months, and then they have some slow progression. And then I have a few patients who are actually completed two years of therapy, and um, we think about giving them a little of a break, and that's when they present with, with the progression, sort of a late progressors. 
I think immunologically and from a tumor microenvironment, these are completely different categories of patients, and most likely, they will need different treatment approaches. The problem here is that, at least at this point, to try to figure out what exactly we need to do with these patients requires a substantial amount of tumor sampling. And by that, I mean perhaps even sequential tumor sampling. Because if we want to understand the tumor microenvironment and try to understand why it is that one tumor has responded for two years is now progressing, or why it is that a different tumor, a different patient, has had absolutely no response to immunotherapy, then we need to understand what is the interaction at the level of host with the tumor. And that means that you have to have tumor samples. Um, a lot of different ideas and theories have been proposed, and there are a couple of potential mechanisms that have been identified. This is just one example uh, of uh, a publication that we're trying to see if we can actually um, uh, bring this into real clinical practice, at least at Fox Chase. What simply this publication and this review says is that you can have multiple mechanisms for immunotherapy resistance. It could be a matter of uh, not having enough um, T cells formation and generation. It could be a matter of a dysfunction in the effector cell functioning of the T cells. It could be T cell exhaustion or other presentation issues, or it could be that you just uh, are not forming memory T cells. And even though this is a busy slide, if you go to this reference, you'll see that for each one of these potential resistant mechanisms, we have identified a couple of potential players that we can interact with trying to overcome the resistant mechanisms. The problem is, this takes time. So if you have a patient who's progressing sitting in front of you and you have a biopsy done, you have to have a lot of resources devoted to integrating these samples kind of in real time so that within a week or two you can decide what kind of treatment you're going to have to give to your patients. But I think this is the kind of work that we need. This is another simpler example, probably, from our colleagues at Yale Cancer Center, who basically look at about 300 different lung cancer patients, and they divided them into four separate categories. And these are rather simple categories. These go from the spectrum of having a tumor with no PDL1 expression and no tumor infiltrating lymphocytes or TELS, all the way to a tumor that has both high PDL1 and high TELS, and then you have stuff in between. No PDL1 but TELS, and no TELS but PDL1 expression. Again, I think it's easy to see, based on an analysis like that, that these are different tumors. Therefore, to anticipate that we can come up with one treatment option that's going to be applicable to all of this is a misnomer. We're never going to get there. So somehow we have to identify the right patient and pair the right patient with the right treatment option so that we can overcome some of these resistant mechanisms. Again, this requires tissue, so you have to have a biopsy. You have to have resources to analyze the data and make a decision in a real-time basis what combination you're going to give based on what you see in the tumor microenvironment. Can we do this routinely? I'll probably say not yet. There are a few centers around the world who can do this, but we're not all there. Can we learn from the tumor sample and translate it into something that potentially has a marker in the peripheral blood to make it easier? Uh, that's the holy grail, and that's where most of the research is going. So I'm going to highlight a couple of clinical trials that I think, in my view, are interesting and perhaps something that we can learn from, but keep in mind that we have no phase three studies. You have seen different versions of the slides. You might even have seen the slide at different uh, uh, meetings. This is just to highlight the sheer number of different uh, immunotherapy-based treatments that we have available in combination with currently available checkpoint inhibitors for the most part. So why do we do that? Well, we're familiar with PD-1s, PD-L1s, with CTLA-4s. They're there. We know the mechanism. We know the toxicity. Um, we know that at least in the majority of our patients, we can get some sort of a response from the, these uh, currently available checkpoint inhibitors. So it's kind of easy to try to combine other drugs with them. They overcome some T-cell exhaustion. So there's a lot of reasons why we want to combine them with the PD-1s, PD-L1s, or the CTLA-4s that we have. But I would be, um, I'm pretty confident in saying that we don't really understand half of the mechanisms for these combinations that we take into the clinic. We're doing empiric treatments for the most part because we're not taking time to interrogate the tumor samples. 
So one of the areas that's receiving a lot of attention when it comes to immune modulation, uh, as it is in a number of different malignancies, is the uh, concept of epigenetic modification. These drugs have been around for quite some time. They serve a role in patients with uh, different uh, hematologic malignancies or myelodysplastic syndromes. Um, they have very unique toxicities, and we've gone through several different generations of these uh, uh, epigenetic modifiers. One of the newer ones is this drug called uh, antennostat, which really is a histone deacetylase inhibitor. It's an oral agent. There's a lot of literature as to how this drug works, but one of the things that we're learning is that the epigenetic modification of the tumor sample of the tumor can actually have an impact on the immune milieu, the immune microenvironment, and therefore there is at least preclinical rationale to try to combine drugs such as antenostat with a checkpoint inhibitor. Uh, this led to a multi-cohort phase one study in combination with pembrolizumab. The cohort that involves the non-small cell lung cancer patient population was presented by Matthew Hellman uh, at the World Lung Conference last year. Smaller study, um, uh, PDL1 was checked. And the reason I like this, and I'm going to get to it, is that we could have potentially identified a couple of biomarkers that might be helpful in deciding how to take this drug further. So only about 70, 75 patients are in this particular study. Everybody had prior PTL1, PDL1 therapy. When you look at this waterfall plot, it's really not that impressive, unfortunately. You really don't get a feeling that this is a, a very active combination. You look at the spider plots, you sort of get a feel that there are a few patients who certainly are having durable and somewhat deep responses to this combination. Like anything else in oncology, then the question is, well, what is it about those tumors that is causing this kind of a deep and durable response, and why don't we have it for the majority of patients in this particular study? Well, Let's talk about a little bit about the toxicities first, because if we decide something is effective, I think the next big question is, is it tolerable? Well, if you look at the combination like this, you really don't get a sense that there are uh, scary toxicities from the combination of an epigenetic modifier and an immunotherapy drug. No new safety signals come out. Interestingly, though, if you look at the uh, subpopulation that had this uh, monocyte or phenotypically monocyte-looking cells in their peripheral blood, monocyte high versus low, you notice that uh, there is some improvement in progression-free survival. Going back to what Tony was just talking about, if you have a biomarker, you sort of want to have your training and validation set, and we're not having this. However, this could be a hypothesis-generating look that maybe a simple peripheral blood looking at monocytes can identify potentially patients who would benefit from this combination. Similarly, there is a way to measure myelodrite suppressor cells, which, as the name suggests, they're there to suppress some degree of immune response. Well, in this particular study, again, as you see, the patient population that had lower uh, myelodrite suppressor cells had a better response, and therefore it is possible to use this also as a potential biomarker to deck this combination forward, and I'm looking forward to uh, the future of this uh, potential combination. We heard a little bit about the impact of VEGF inhibition and the possibility of an interaction between the VEGF pathway and immune responses. That is not a new story. Ever since we've known about VEGF and we've had VEGF inhibition, people have talked about the potential immune modulatory effect of VEGF inhibition, particularly in the antigen-presenting side of the um, arm of the immune system. In fact, there were vaccine trials that were trying to use that mechanism uh, in combination with VEGF inhibition as a potentiator of immune response when you're, talking, uh, when you're using a vaccine. So the concept has some validity uh, in terms of combining VEGF inhibition with immunotherapy. This particular multi-cohort study um, aim to do just that, combination of ramosurumab plus pembrolizumab in a multi-cohort study was investigated, concentrating on the lung cancer cohort, which again is a smaller patient population. You notice that uh, there is some improvement in uh, PFS and OS, particularly in patients that have higher levels of pdl one 
please keep in mind that we don't have a biomarker for VEGF, even though we've known about this pathway for quite some time, despite uh, tremendous efforts in this field to find a biomarker for VEGF, so we don't really have that. But it is possible that PDL1 could be a differentiator here. Uh, the results of this study and some additional uh, patients that were treated with this combination was interesting enough that I think this combination is moving on to a much larger study to evaluate the combination as a potential therapeutic approach for patients with uh, uh, non-small cell lung cancer who are eligible, obviously, for both IO and VEGF inhibition. Well, other compounds are coming back to the, to the, to the market. All of a sudden, we have a lot of interest in cytokines. For a while, cytokines were there, um, highly toxic. We all remember um, uh, at least either hearing stories or some of us might have treated patients with high dose uh, IL-2. The toxicity was um, uh, pretty significant. However, the cytokines can be very effective. Um, this particular study, the PIVOT02 study, uses a compound that right now we're calling Nectar, Nectar214, the company that has it, uh, which basically uses this pegylated form uh, of, uh, of uh, an IL-2 receptor um, um, a prodrug. And this combination now is getting a lot of attention, again, based on limited data that's been presented uh, combining this particular compound with nivolumab in patients with very uh, malignancies. This pathway, again, is a well-established pathway that um, is known to activate, uh, as you see on the slide, CD8-positive cells, CD4-positive cells, uh, and it can actually lead, uh, if you use um, uh, uh, IL-2 by itself, to cytokine release syndrome, but not so much with this combination. So because of the formulation, this is a much better tolerated drug. Um, we can concentrate on uh, the lung cancer cohort, but I can also tell you that this combination is showing activity in renal cell and melanoma. So to me, that sort of suggests that in an immune responsive tumor microenvironment, like we get with um, the melanoma and renal cell, uh, this combination seems to be active. And I kind of like to see uh, immunologic act activity across many tumor types to sort of um, establish that this mechanism could potentially be um, valid in terms of taking it uh, further. So this is a little bit about the design of the study, dose escalation, and everything like that. If you really concentrate on the lung cancer patient cohort, which again is a much smaller population at this point, we are seeing some responses even in patients who are completely PD-L1 negative, which again, uh, um, goes back to the whole concept of this biomarker that you heard from Tony. How relevant is PDL1? Well, maybe it's very relevant in the frontline setting, but in certain combinations, maybe PDL1 is not really a determinant of response depending on the combination. Maybe TMB would be better down the road if we can establish it as a biomarker. So we really have to um, do a better job of trying to find uh, uh, the patient population that would benefit from these kinds of treatments. And I think that can only happen by having a valid biomarker. So the responses here are early. They're encouraging. Uh, the study is continuing. We're going to have a lot more data coming up for the lung cancer cohort. Uh, but this is the uh, sort of a waterfall plot that you get uh, with uh, patients with renal cell and melanoma, again, indicating rather good activity. Uh, so again, we're hoping that we're going to learn a lot more about this combination in the coming meetings. Uh, this is the list of uh, toxicities that have been reported so far with the limited exposure that we have. Again, no s new really scary safety signals, uh, but obviously all of these drugs, it takes a little bit of uh, experience to try to manage these toxicities. Um, the potential biomarker that they're looking at for uh, the nectar compound, as shown on this particular slide, uh, first of all, there seems to be some hints that PDL1 negative tumors can upregulate PDL1 expression. Uh, again, that goes back to the need for tissue confirmation uh, that might be a little bit more difficult. But again, as you can see on the left hand side of, uh, of this particular slide, uh, there's an increase in proliferation of uh, CD8 positive T cells that can be seen post treatment, uh, so perhaps that's another strategy, give one cycle of therapy. If you get an activation of your potential biomarker, maybe you can decide to continue with the treatment or not. So again, more information is going to come. 
the other compound, again, that's getting some attention and moving on to a larger study is uh, citrovatinib. This is a compound that you know, we sort of used to refer to these as dirty TKIs because they hit multiple different pathways. Um, but sometimes hitting multiple different pathways might actually be a good thing uh, if you are trying to hit different components, uh, for instance, of the immune system to get uh, at a better or a more robust immune activation. Again, the slide is pretty self-explanatory. This particular compound uh, can have an impact on the axle pathway on the VEGFR2, uh, on CKIT, and then you see that depending on the pathway that's hit, you can get various immunologic effects uh, from, the, the, from the one drug that you have at hand. Another dose escalation, dose expansion study was conducted with this um, uh, drug in combination with, uh, with nivolumab. And again, uh, in a limited set of data uh, that has been presented at a couple of different meetings, we get a side effect profile that tells us really severe grades three and four toxicities are really not there with this combination. There is a little bit more of grade one and two, especially when it comes to diarrhea, rash, and things like that. And again, I don't want to discount these great two toxicities. They can have an impact on patient quality of life, but we're sort of trained uh, to look at really severe side effects. But I think at some point, we have to sort of keep patient quality of life in mind when it comes to these great two toxicities. These are the response rate and the duration of responses we're getting from this particular combination. Many of these responses do seem to be durable, uh, and the waterfall plot suggests that there is fairly decent activity. Again, is this enough to overcome most of the resistant mechanisms that we could potentially see post-checkpoint inhibitor? That I'm not sure, and I think, again, additional information is needed. And this combination, you're going to hear a little bit more about it because it is moving on uh, as far as I can do determined to a phase three study. Uh, again, looking at PDL1 level of expression, uh, there seems to be some association, but again, because the data set is kind of limited, I don't think we can make a lot of conclusions about the validity of choosing patients based on PDL1, at least as far as I'm concerned, uh, looking into this data. Um, the last compound that I want to talk about is this vabetuximab because uh, vabetuximab is actually um, kind of interesting. This is a phosphatidylserine targeting antibody uh, that actually does have uh, uh, quite a lot of immune stimulatory effect. However, in this study, we didn't use it as an immune modulator. Based on some preclinical studies and other um, uh, published reports, uh, this was taken into a clinical trial, as you see highlighted here, randomized about 120 different patients to two different doses of Vavi plus uh, sort of the um, standard of care treatment with docetaxel uh, with combination with Vavi. The study overall um, did not show a positive um, outcome. There were some methodological issues in that a couple of the doses of these uh, uh, drugs, uh, the, the, when you read the paper, the drug labeling was mixed up a little bit, so they had to pool all the data together. So even though this study was technically a negative trial, it didn't meet its primary endpoint. Because the compound does have some immune modulatory effect, I think we're going to be seeing some uh, new combinations in conjunction with checkpoint inhibitors coming. So combining this with chemo or using it as a single agent is probably not as attractive, but a combination with an immunotherapy drug is on the works, and I think we're going to be hearing more about it soon. So uh, with the use of chemo and IO in the frontline setting for majority of our patients, or even IO in this setting, I think we're going to be faced with a large number of patients who have this refractory chemo IO disease. And if we're not happy with docetaxel the way we were not a few years ago, I think we're going to have to do a better job of identifying new treatment options for these patients. I think recognizing some of these mechanisms of resistance to immunotherapy is going to be significant. I think, and I hope, we're going to get to a point where we truly can identify uh, why tumors are immune resistant and what we can do to overcome them, perhaps a different combination for different patients. And after all, that's the promise we made about 10 years ago when we decided to have, to have personalized treatment for our patients. Uh, we've gone back a little bit. We're sort of doing you know, chemo IO for everybody type of an approach. Uh, but I think if we can regroup and come back and try to identify uh, different subpopulation of patients who might benefit from specific combinations, uh, we can get back on track and help our patients. So uh, we're looking forward to those new promising combinations. Thank you. 
Thank you, uh, Haas. Have a seat in the hot seat. Um, so uh, you, you laid out eloquently some of the trials going on in the refractory space. Let me ask you, what do you do off trial? For yeah. a patient who is progressing on triplet therapy, maybe got a couple of cycles of maintenance, what is the regimen that you're going to? And do you sometimes do one regimen over another based on what's happening in terms of their progression? So if I don't have a clinical trial, is that basically a yeah. standard of care? Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, if a patient has progressed through chemotherapy and I.O., the regimen that I use is usually docetaxel with or without ramasuramab. Okay. Um, the decision is uh, whether to use ramasuramab or not. I mean, I'm not particularly happy with the slight improvement we got in overall survival based on the dosi ramasuramab study, but if I have a patient with good enough performance status and I'm not too worried about toxicities, then that is a regimen that I would consider using. So in the absence of clinical trial, again, as I said in my talk, it's back to the standard chemo that we've had before. Yeah. Okay. And, um, you know, to me, the science is evolving so quickly, but some of these trials, it's like, <clears throat> throwing spaghetti up on a wall and seeing yeah. how it sticks. Right. Which noodle do you think will stick? Uh, is there one that's kind of lean the way? Epigenetic priming is something that we're involved with at Hopkins. Mm -hmm. uh, you mentioned the IL-2 pathway, antiangiogenesis. There's something that's sort of leading the way that early signals suggest that uh, yeah. there may be a winner. I think that's hard. Again, I think every one of these tumors is a little bit different. I really think we need to figure out which one of these tumors is going to respond to uh, the IL-2 pathway and which one is going to respond to the VEGF inhibition. An all-comer, expecting to have an all-comer that would work on everybody uniformly, I think is going to be a mistake. But if, you, if I were to sort of predict what's going to be um, something that's going to be here in five years, I would probably say that IO plus VEGF is something that's going to be here uh, for us to use. Let me ask a question that came in through the, uh, the iPad here, um, and I think it's a good one. You just mentioned it in your answer. Maybe you can elaborate. Do we need to include a PD-1 or PDL one drug in the refractory setting, or are we essentially testing the single agent activity of the, the novel drug that we're adding to it? I mean, does every study need to have an immunotherapy combo? Can we, are there trials that are not looking at... Uh, IO combos in the refractory setting? Do we need a PDL1 drug there? I guess or it PD1 depends drug? what your hypothesis yeah. is. Yeah. So we have used a lot of tyrosine kinase inhibitors now um, in conjunction with immunotherapy. We've used a lot of different antibodies like ramasutumab with the PD1 inhibitors. I guess it depends on what it is that you're trying to accomplish. Yeah. Um, are we suggesting that we go back and try a docetaxel combination with something, yeah. which again comes with its own potential toxicities and issues? So, in a way, in the absence of um, a, a legitimate drug that you can easily combine, which has the safety profile, which has a little bit of a track record of activity, yes, we're yeah. stuck with what we have right now. Maybe one of the newer generations of immunotherapy drugs, a TEM3 and OX40, something like that, would eventually emerge as a new partner for something different. But as it stands now, I think, yeah, we're going to have to have a checkpoint inhibitor in there. Okay. I don't know what Tony feels about that. Yeah, I think, you know, in a way is that we, is the end of it is the T cell that's going to be your soldier. And then the, clearly the PDL1 was able to move, mobilize some of them right. to be able to tackle. So whatever you add on, if you don't have the soldier to move in, you still you know, will not eliminate the cancer cell. So I think uh, it's probably inevitable. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So for the sake of time, let's, let's move to the cases. And I hope these cases are designed to bring this all together, the, the talks that Tony and, and Haas uh, 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 delivered, um, given all the complexity, and I'm, I'm hopefully, I don't think we'll have right answers here, but certainly they highlight some of the challenges of decision making uh, for, for patients. So this is case one, 65-year-old uh, former smoker, 20-pack year history, but quit 10 years ago. His past medical history um, is uh, only significant for rheumatoid arthritis, well controlled on medication. Um, presents with a minimal cough, some shortness of breath. The chest x-ray is done. It reveals a right upper lobe opacity. This is followed by a CAT scan that reveals a six centimeter mass in the right upper lobe. It abuts the mediastinum, has multiple rib bony lesions. 
A biopsy is done that reveals CK7, TTF1 positive adenocarcinoma. The PDL1 is right at that cut point, 50%. Molecular interrogation reveals some interesting mutations that we're hearing more and more about, specifically at this ASCO, uh, SCK11 mutation uh, coexisting with a KRAS. The MRI of the brain is negative. The full staging PET confirms a PET avid lesions in the right upper lobe, the bony lesions, and an adrenal nodule that's two centimeters. So essentially a stage four patient with a history of rheumatoid arthritis yet well controlled <laughs> on medication, PDL1 greater than 50%, KRAS, and STK11 <laughs> mutation. So, <coughs> let's discuss. <coughs> Tony, I'll start with you. Okay. Optimal regimen in this patient, what you would treat them with. This is the 50% cutoff. You talked about the decision-making between triplet and single agent. Right. What do you think? So, as per Kinox 024, that this patient can use single agent PAMPO. You think it's nice and easy. But once you see the as, <coughs> as, uh, as, at SDK 11, then you say, hey, this is going to work well. And as a matter of fact, abstract 102 presented today from MD Anderson. It's not just SDK, uh, LK11. There's another one called KIP1, KEAP. It's not that uncommon, the KIP1, yeah. as a matter of fact. Uh, when the both are uh, mutation positive, so-called so uh, SLK and SDK and uh, KIP1 positive, the survival is just bottom up. Yeah. So that worries me. So for this patient, then I started to wonder, hey, maybe I use some chemotherapy there just to make sure. So uh, previously I argued that I tried to use single agent, but for this patient, I'm a little bit more prone to use chemo plus IO. So the mutational profile tips you over to add the chemotherapy. But as a matter of fact, you know, while I say that, the, <laughs> the, the, so the so-called the, uh, the retrospective study done by MD Anderson, they were actually on chemo and IO. Yeah. The bottom out is not single agent. The yeah. bottom out is actually chemo IO. Anyway, yeah. what do you think? Hi. I think it's challenging. I think definitely single agent IO for me is out with the SDK11 being there. Mm -hmm. I don't feel comfortable with a single agent IO, even though the patient has PDL1 over 50%. Mm -hmm. I would also agree that despite what we saw today, I would still use a chemo IO regimen uh, for a couple of reasons. A, the data presented today still is retrospective. There was no central confirmation of any of these uh, mutational analysis. There was no central control of the PDL1 expression. So when you go to retrospective data, it's hypothesis generating. I think we should pay attention to it. But when you have a patient like this with this much burden of disease, I think you have to bite the bullet and give the patient the most aggressive treatment you have, within reason, obviously. This patient has a reasonable uh, performance status. And I think for me, that would be chemotherapy plus IO. The alternative would be chemo followed by IO. And even though Tony mentioned that, that he uses that sometimes for his PDL1 negative patients, I would argue that even though the PFS curves from the two studies that you highlighted, yes, they're not promising. Yeah. But the overall survival trumps PFS as far as I'm concerned. And if I ask any of my patients, I think at the end of the day, survival is what they want. Therefore, for me, for patients like that, I would use a chemo IO combination because I'm still getting a better survival. The other thing that bothers me about this patient is the history of rheumatoid arthritis. Um, the patient is well controlled, without need for medications. I think that's a different story. But if you have a rheumatoid patient who actually requires low-dose methotrexate, prednisone, whatever. I think that poses another problem for immunotherapy, and I've definitely caused pain and suffering for patients that have had you know, rheumatoid, that I've taken them off the methotrexate to put them on IO, and the joints blow up and they're in pain. So I don't think we've done any service to them. Yeah. So I think we do have to be careful with that. What if it's a control to Crohn's disease? Would it worry you a bit more? If they're on active medication, I am very hesitant about using IO. Tony, your thoughts on this? Well, I just, RA? Well, if, if the patient have a long history of control and never have severe problem, I'm comfortable. But if the patient actually had a history of severe Crohn's, but yeah. now under good control, I still worry that I would trigger, get him back to the bad situation. Uh, uh, yeah. no, no data, yeah. but it's just the sense, you know, if, if the patient have a history of a severe episode, yeah. that, that worry me more. Let me uh, take out the STK11. Let's just throw a curveball in here. Let's just say this patient had a KRAS mutation. Mm -hmm. And, you know, this has some symptoms. Mm -hmm. Single agent IO versus triplet therapy. Uh, is there, what's your break point for adding in the chemo in this setting? Huh? Well, 
Tony, go ahead. Key, key mode doesn't work that well in KRAS anyway, yeah. <laughs> independently. Yeah. And so I, I think that does not change my so-called thinking too much. Uh, in a way is that uh, in the Keynote 042, 024, we excluded EGFL only, yeah. but I'm quite sure there's some KRAS patient there. Oh yeah. You know, I mean, and so, you know, in, in a sense is that this is within the indication of single agent IO, you know, even is KRAS positive. Yeah, but the trigger for me would be, you know, literally somebody who's losing a pound a week sitting in front of you, and there's so much pain and discomfort that you need that 45, 50% reduction, then I would use the chemo combination. Because you know, at best of studies, uh, looking at chemo um, um, 024 versus 042, right? In 042, the response rate in 50% patient population is a little bit lower, around 40%. In 024, it was 45%. Yeah. With mm -hmm. chemo combination, you can push that up to about 55%. So if I really need to get some shrinkage, get the disease under control, I would use even a couple of cycles of chemo to get that side of reduction. Tony's point is completely valid. KRAS patients, some of them anyway, don't respond to chemo that well, but I think it would be a little bit more than single agent IO. So symptomatically, I would use a judgment uh, of how sick a patient is okay. and decide chemo versus single agent IO. Let's go to one more uh, area that's a little more contentious now in lung cancer, which is the role of radiation for oligometastatic disease. Let's yeah. say that this patient, and you remember they had bony mets, and, and, and let's just say that this patient just had a five centimeter lung mass that was biopsy proven lung cancer and a two centimeter adrenal nodule and nothing else lighting on PET. Yeah. Had some data emerged from, yeah. from, from, uh, from Sabre Comet and some other, and the Gomez data, uh, looking at aggressive management of, of, of oligometastatic disease. We've seen also that radiation may be synergistic with immunotherapy. Mm -hmm. um, Maybe. Ideas, maybe. Ide would, would you consider for an aggressive approach radiating both sites and giving them uh, immunotherapy? Why not surgery? <laughs> or You're surgery. Go for a cure, why yeah. not go for okay. it? Okay. Right? Okay. I think there is a lot of older data, valid data, that isolated adrenal metastases is curable. Yeah. So I would be very much inclined to go after curing this patient population, followed by you know a couple of cycles of sort of adjuvant uh, chemotherapy, save the IO. Um, radiation would make sense uh, for patients who are not necessarily surgical candidates, or as you suggested, maybe using that potentially apscopal effect, which mm. again, I think it's more of a Bigfoot sighting, you hear about it more than you see it at this point, but I think we need to learn how to use radiation, right? I think we haven't gotten there yet. Uh, but yeah, for oligometastatic disease, I believe the data, and I'm in a right patient population, I think you should be aggressive. Tony? So radiation for a specific purpose, like local control of symptom or potential increase, a bit of a chance of a cure, that I can agree to. Uh, but thinking radiation may boost the immune outcome yeah. that I cannot buy for the time okay. being. Uh, some, at least in Hong Kong, I don't know about the United States, yeah. some radiation oncology of selling the concept, say, oh, doesn't matter, I give you radiation somewhere, it will help you to get your immune outcome to be yeah. better. Right. That concept I cannot buy. Yeah. Right. Okay. We haven't bought into it here either. Yeah. It's just that it's under investigation yeah. and I think we need to continue. I think some ongoing clinical trials will clarify it. I right. would agree. I think yeah. we're, we're still waiting for more answers uh, from trials. All right, so let's move on to case two, which is actually a, a patient of mine, a real <laughs> patient, a 40-year-old, uh, never smoker, incredible story, formal N Navy SEAL, uh, Congressional Medal of Honor recipient and Secret Service agent mm -hmm. um, who presented with cough and worsening hip pain on a walk in the woods with the president uh, in 2016. Mm -hmm. You can uh, figure out which out president, president that was. <laughs> uh, it was still 2016, um, not 17 yet. Um, this persists. He eventually sees an MRI of the hip revealing bony metastases and a large sclerotic lesion. The chest CT reveals a 7.7 .7 centimeter by 5.1 spiculated mass in the medial left upper lobe, uh, a 2.5 mass in the inferior right liver, destructive lesion in the left posterior 10th rib, uh, metastatic disease. A biopsy is done in an outside hospital on the bone. I put no there. Please don't biopsy the bone. Um, the PDL1 is 90%. Uh, but unfortunately, the bone is not the best place to go for molecular interrogation. Decalcification can occur through the processing. So we don't get the information off the biopsy. But the stay, the liquid biopsy, comes in uh, and reveals an EGFR exon 19 sensitizing mutation. 
He started on osimertinib, has a clinically meaningful response and durability for 20 months. More recently, has developed worsening disease in the chest and new lesions in the liver, new bony areas. We rebiopsy him. It reveals nothing actionable. His PDL1 is 90%. His TMB is right there at the cutoff and sweet spot. Two, 10 mutations per megabase. He's got a P53 and he's got the original sensitizing mutation. So, patients st essentially with stage 4 disease, EGFR positive, on osimertinib, has a nice response, and then progresses with nothing actionable with that PDL1 of 90%. Uh, talk about a, a, a contentious area right now of what to do or, or conflicting data. So, Tony, I'll turn to you as the EGFR guy. So uh, I'll first check if the Russian had inserted mutation to him. You know. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. Let's say that was checked and it was, it, there, was, there was no Russian influence on this mutation. All right, okay. <laughs> okay. Now, so EGFR mutation positive patient, t negative in a biopsy. Let me just take one step back. Can we trust the biopsy negative for t M entirely? So right now, he got multiple site of progression, liver and lung, and there are actually potential heterogeneous disease. What if his plasma is positive while your biopsy is negative? Mm -hmm. So it may get an argument, but then expect better. However, on this patient, you know, he's also in first line, yep. then you really don't have that much option. The MAC, the C797S is all experimental. Mm -hmm. So now going back, so assuming that that thing is out, then you have to say chemo IO versus IO. Now, you have the tendency at 90%, TMB10. Number one, is this data applicable to a EGF mutation positive patient? We don't have the data. Yep. Second, the combination. What well, we are doing study, checkmate 722, TCIM negative patient, oximetry failure, randomized to chemo nevo, EP nevo versus chemo. And also, Kino uh, 789. Chemo Pembo versus chemo. We are asking the question. Mm -hmm. So if we're asking question, it means that we don't have the answer. Right. If we don't have the answer, should we give them the combination? No. So I'm so still th that's my question to you. So <laughs> that's why I'm saying that I'm still going to give him chemo first. Okay. I will leave the IO as the uh, second line treatment or third line treatment for this patient. Well, I have another reason why I don't want to give this patient immunotherapy at this point. It's just coming off of Asimardna. There's a potential interaction, although yep. if you start with IO, then do RC, there seems to be more toxicity. If you start with RC, then go to IO, there seems to be less toxicity. So what we're talking about are these uh, emerging data that some of these TKIs uh, don't seem to work very well with the checkpoint inhibitors causing a lot more toxicities. I think you do have to be careful with that. What's but the I'm washout period? We don't know. I mean, RC Martin probably would be a little bit shorter, but if you start with IO, yeah. your washout period could be months. So, so actually, there was, I think, one paper suggests three months, right? There's a small paper. But that was extremely hypothetical. There was right. not much of a rationale behind it. So I'm not sure. But in this patient, I would be more than happy to start with chemotherapy and continue it as much as possible. And then at progression, yeah. probably consider either adding IO or bringing it. So nobody in favor of Empower 150. We haven't bought into the story. This is yeah. the recently approved regimen in the U.S. Yeah. Four drug regimen, young guy. Um, you know, the data is, the Empower regimen is not approved for EGFR positive patients. We mm. saw a trend in those patients yeah. who got a but, TKI. But, but, the, but the question is, it is compared to Texocarbo, BEF is better. Yeah. But it's not comparing to Olympicarbo. Beth, that's, that's better. Yeah. Yeah. So we, we don't know that. We don't have the answer to that one. Yeah. Yeah. You know. But we have a study coming. We it, do. Exactly. So we're doing that. Right? Um, so chemo is, is the comfort level for chemo for both of you post. Is, is yeah, with so, or without. so what I may tend to do, which is a little bit off record, but still possible except I will give him a limited garbo first. If it fails, I may give him I'm power 150. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, that would be a reasonable approach. All yeah. right. Yeah. What if this patient were exon 20, a non-sensitizing mutation? Let's say the patient did not get to Grisso. We're talking about the treatment-naive setting. He mm -hmm. presented uh, up front with stage 4 disease, and he's got a non-sensitizing exon 20. He's not eligible for POSI. He's not eligible for TAC-788. He's not eligible for the J&J &J drug we <laughs> saw today. Uh, yeah, they're out. I'm making it hard here. What is the optimal regimen for a non-sensitizing EGFR mutation? Is there an optimal regimen? Uh, or is it the same as it was for the resistance setting for the sensitizing mutation? Is it just chemo uh, with or without BEV? Do we use IO in this setting? So again, off of a clinical trial, um, it's hard to know exactly what to do these, with these patients because we don't have the data, as Tony just enumerated. But for me, an exon 
20 mutations still is an EGFR mutated lung cancer. We don't have drugs for it, but it's an EGFR mutated lung, right? So if I extrapolate that data, that IO by itself in most EGFR positive patients is inactive, mm -hmm. then I probably won't go EGF, um, uh, immunotherapy alone. Yeah. If anything, I would consider the combination of a triple drug. These patients respond very well for, to uh, pemetrexid-based uh, platinum doublets. So I don't want to deprive the patient from that. So I think the chemo is going to be part of the combination. Um, so probably there's going to be a discussion with the patient. We can add the immunotherapy. I'm not sure you're going to get anything out of it. You could have a little bit more toxicity, but that would be the way to sort of maximize your treatment option. Yeah. Um, is pd one informative at all here? What if the TMB were a little bit higher and you had the, the liquid biopsy that also showed a high TMB? <laughs> would that be informative? I mean, would if... Now, so, so you use the word is Swiss spot for TMB 10. That yeah. is only foundation one report yes. as a Swiss spot. You know, I, in a sense... Say it's 16 in the blood. Yeah, 16 in the blood. <laughs> no, because, you know, the, the, the so-called the 10 that... Checkmate 26 use is actually whole exome sequencing. Right. It's actually not, yeah. you know, a uh, particular sequencing. So I think we still got a lot of this lingual confusion, right. you know, to the to the to the general oncologist because of what it exactly imply. And we also know one fact is this: there's no correlation between PDI1 and TMB yeah, from right. two both study. Yeah. It's almost like flat, you know, that you really cannot say high TMB is correlated with um, PDI1 overexpression. So I think those are two independent. For this patient, I would still, if it's X120, I would take the um, so-called the uh, PDI1 uh, relatively seriously. I'm more prone to give them a combination. Okay. You know. So. About the TMB-10, and I understand all the criticism about the TMB. <laughs> there are no problems about it. And obviously, I'm conflicted because I've been part of those studies. But the TMB-10 came from Checkpoint 12, which was a yep. phase one study, mm -hmm. then a confirmatory, pretty large phase two, Checkpoint 568, where the same thing was confirmed. Area under the curve looks pretty promising. 10 is right where the shoulder is on the area under the curve. So there's actually pretty good amount of work that went into defining 10 as the cutoff. So that um, is what it is at this point. The, the bigger question is what you pointed out, is this an appropriate way of measuring TMB based on 300 gene panel as opposed yeah. to the whole exam? So yeah. I think that's the difference. Yeah. I would not use TMB at this point clinically. Okay. However, I tell you, since we get the data on TMB when we do next-gen sequencing, if I have somebody who's progressing and I'm looking for a clinical trial and they have high TMB, I gravitate more towards phase one drugs that are based on immunotherapy because I think there might be utility there but as if, opposed to something other. If based there. on 227, high TMB, you should use IOIO. If I had the approval, I would have considered it, <laughs> but I don't have that approval, we right? We don't right now. Yeah. Not right now. <laughs> Not right now. Okay. Let's, um, let's move on to the last case. Um, this is actually mirrored, not exactly a case I had of my patient, but, but, but very similar. I've had several of these patients. 82-year-old male, ECOG2, heavy smoker, uh, a clinical enrichment factor for uh, predicts efficacy immunotherapy. Uh, presents with uh, fatigue, ongoing cough, some bone pain. The CAT scan reveals a left lower lobe lesion, four centimeters, some pleural-based <coughs> lesions. The PET scan confirms the left lower lobe mass and the pleural-based disease stage four. The biopsy reveals a PCC3 positive squamous cell lung cancer, PDL1, 1%. Heavy smoker, squamous cell, PDL1, 1%. He's got a borderline performance status, that wide range of ECOG2 um, that defines a lot of patients and a spectrum, MRI is negative. Patient not averse to chemotherapy, uh, but also wants to focus on quality of life. Um, so Tony, you, you talked a lot about this in your talk, you know, the, 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 the regimens that are approved in 024, now 042 with a, a break point of greater than 1%. Um, what do you recommend to this patient uh, at 1%? Um, yes, this is the one situation that I will find my study useful. <laughs> that, <laughs> at least you can justify to say that, yes, you can use, uh, you know, single agent, and then you will have a similar efficacy as chemotherapy, and that would be a one option for the patient. Right. Mm -hmm. Now, on the other hand, you can call uh, Kinoc 407. You use Abraxan mm -hmm. combination, mm -hmm. and Abraxan relatively is less toxic. Right. And then the question is that whether you, you, you should want to use carbo or not. So some of this patient, I may just use Abraxan mm -hmm. and IO and skip the carbo. Okay. 
Yeah. Toss your thoughts. I've actually done that. I've done a rack stain plus IO, skipping the carbo part because of the potential mild suppression in older patients with a poor PS. But if the patient is willing to be treated and you uh, can monitor them closely, I think it's a very reasonable option. Not too happy with single agent Pembro for 1% or higher, but I agree with Tony. It gives us an option for patients who don't want chemo or who we don't think they can tolerate chemo. Yeah. It's no worse than chemotherapy, but it's yeah. not necessarily better. Yeah. yeah. Right? I, I would agree. I mean, I've, I've had several patients like this. I think yeah. the 1 to 49, we still <coughs> are trying sure. to learn a little bit about how to treat those patients if they're not chemo eligible, but I think single agent IO may this, be. Mm. This is my first and possibly the last IO study that I do, so <laughs> I'm, I'm glad to be remembered somehow. <laughs> um, <laughs> Excellent. Thank you. And with that, thank you again for the audience participation questions. Thank you for coming. And again, thanks to uh, Tony and Haas for a great discussion. And Dr. Levy. Dr. Levy. <laughs> this activity has been jointly provided by Medical Learning Institute, Incorporated, and PVI, Peerview Institute for Medical Education. Thank you for listening. Download materials and complete the post test for instant credit at peerview.com forward slash WED860. This activity is supported by an independent educational grant from Merck and Company Incorporated.